Now, without anyone naming names or raising, someone raised their hand when I asked this last at Green City, it's pretty funny. Without anyone responding in any way, I want you to ask you a question. Do any of you have a friend who's not good for you? I mean, not all the time, but you know, anyone have a friend that can be so cynical that, that they just kind of drag you down, or maybe so self-centered it always got to turn back to them, or, or maybe someone who just holds a grudge and, and you can't get over something because they'll never let it go? Maybe, maybe you have a friend like that. Not, not like they'd be good, bad for you all the time or else they wouldn't be your friend, but eh, maybe. Maybe you all are blessed with wonderful friends, so maybe a different question might be for you today. Have you ever realized that you have an oblief, a belief or an assumption that isn't good for you? Right? Maybe something profound. No one would ever forgive me if they really knew everything I'd done, or I'll never amount to much. Or maybe something less profound, a little bit more practical. I, I've realized in the last years that uh, I assume that I have to prove to you that I'm working hard, and, and so I want you to know how hard I'm working, and uh, I might be just a touch of a workaholic. And, and, and I've realized, I mean, it's, 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 it's a belief that about myself, and it, it doesn't help, because it makes me portray what I'm doing as that something less than the wonderful thing it is. I serve the church for a living, and that's, that's, that's a joy, that's wonderful. And, and, but, but that belief that I, I need to show you how hard I'm working, it's not good, it's not good for me. Right? Maybe you have a belief like that you need to name. These questions came to mind as I contemplated what's the worst thing you could do to a puzzle? Well, what's the worst thing you can, you can answer this question. What's the worst thing you can do to a puzzle? There's something worse. There is something even worse than losing a piece. It's having another piece from a different puzzle put in, right? Because what happens then? You have this piece and you're, you, it's got to fit there somewhere and you're just trying to shut. And you know you can make a puzzle piece fit. You just shove it hard enough. That's the worst thing you can do to a puzzle is have pieces from a different puzzle that are mismatched that don't belong in the puzzle. Right? We're going to be looking at that today. The idea that... Uh, if, if our life is a puzzle, in a sense, as we talked about last week, I'm not throwing any puzzles this week, promise. Uh, if our life is a puzzle designed to be put together a certain way, uh, the worst thing, the, one of the worst things we can do is, is put the wrong pieces in the puzzle. We're going to be looking at that both at the national le level and then at the individual level. First, we start at the level uh, of a nation. We start with Israel. The nation uh, of Israel. We, we read out the book of Lamentations, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a book lamenting that they have gone into exile, lamenting how bad things have, have gotten. I, the original name for the book of Lamentations I actually like better. The Jewish practice is you take the first word of the book and you call the book by that word. And, and so the book of Numbers comes from the first name, the first word, it, which is number, right? Um, and the first book, the first word in the book of Lamentations is how. And that's a great question for a book that's, that's questioning. How did this happen? How did we get this way? How, how are we going to live in this foreign nation? How are we going to dare to have children? How, are, how is this going to work? And so this, this question is, is answered. The book asks, how did this happen? And in the first verses, it, it answers it. The, the nation of Israel is in exile because of mismatched pieces. It was designed to live as God's people to live a certain way, but they have chosen poorly. They have chosen the wrong lovers. And when you talk about lovers in the Old Testament, that's the imagery for what gods you love. And so they have chosen to love the wrong gods. They have chosen the, the wrong friends who have now become enemies. They have chosen badly when it comes to leaders. And the imagery there is great. The leaders are like stags who have not eaten enough. And so so when the hunter comes, the stag can't run away fast enough. And so when the invasion comes, their leaders are weak, like a weak stag who is easy to hunt down. And so this is a, an amazing list of the wrong pieces that the nation of Israel has chosen. They have chosen, as they put together the puzzle of their life together, they have chosen the wrong lovers, the wrong friends, and the wrong leaders. Ugh. 
Right? And so what happens after they, they have this mismatch, they have chosen poorly, this leads them to the lowest point thus far in Israel's history. After choosing less than wisely, they feel uh, this great loss, for the city is empty like a widow who has lost her husband. The nation, which was once a princess, is now a vassal. The roads now mourn because there is no one to walk upon them. The gates are desolate, lacking trade, and the children of the nation are captive because they have chosen the wrong pieces, mismatched pieces that were not meant to be in their puzzle. We now move from this sort of vast view of an entire nation and all the big pieces that they chose poorly down to a much smaller situation, one small case, one man and one decision, one one mismatched piece. Zechariah, we know the story of Zechariah. He's an older man, he has no children, and he goes to to lead worship, and um, as he goes, he has his beliefs about who God is and what God can do, and what what can he hope for, what's God capable of doing in his life. He has all these beliefs that make up what he knows about God, and he shows up, and the angel says, you will have a child, and this child, he's going to be a humdinger. That's my translation. He's going to be a humdinger. He is going to lead the people back to God. He's going to lead children back to their parents. He is going to prepare the way of the Lord. You're going to watch him because he's going to be something else. And his response is, how can this be? I'm old. My wife's old. And that's not the right response, right? It's, it's the moment which should be a moment of joy to him is a moment of doubt because his belief about what God can do is, is incorrect. It's wrong. And so he then goes into an exile of his own. The nation of, of Israel goes into exile in a foreign land. He has an exile of a different sort. He goes into exile because he cannot speak. Now, If I couldn't speak for nine months, some of you might rejoice, but I could still communicate with you, right? Email, text, Facebook, I could get in touch with you. In first century Roman, uh, Jewish Roman culture, first you'd have to, he can read and write, but first he'd have to find someone else who could read. 10% literacy rate, right? And then he'd have to find something to write on. We have paper all over the place. Back in the first century, paper, no, they they write on tablets and stuff like that, and papyrus and and scrolls, and those are expensive. You just don't take one of those to write off a sticky note. And so, for him to not be able to speak, he probably didn't communicate with anyone for nine months, at least nine months, if not more. And so he has plenty of time in his own little personal exile to contemplate what he did say and what he should have said when the angel tells him he's going to have a child. And so we have the nation in exile, we have Zechariah in his own personal little exile, and we see what happens when, uh, and you can think of exile sort of the, as the divine uh, go in your room and think about what you've done. Because that's what happens. They go to their room, they think about what they're done, and they think about two things. First thing is, is they think about is, what have they done? What went wrong? You can deny there's a problem until you find yourself in exile. When you find yourself in exile, can you deny that there's a problem anymore? Nope. And so they sit down as a nation, as a Hebrew nation, the Jewish nation, and they contemplate what have they done. And what we have in the book of Lamentations is the explanation of what they have done wrong, what, what they have messed up, how they have put their lives together as a nation poorly. And, and it was probably written by the prophet Jeremiah, who you may remember is the guy who looks at Israel and again and again and again says, take care of the, uh, the orphan, the widow, and the outcast. Come back to God. And he says those things again and again and again. And so when Lamentations is written by Jeremiah, that's the focus. They've chosen poorly. They have not taken care of the widow, the outcast, the orphan. They've not turned back to God. They didn't choose the right lovers, friends, or leaders. It's not impressive that the book was written What's amazing is that the book was kept. Because if you think about it, for an entire people in exile to hold on to the book that explains how badly they messed up, whew, right? They read this book by Jeremiah and they said, yeah, that that is us, that is what we did. Ugh, right? 
So in exile, the first thing you do is you have time to realize what you have done. No, no glossing it over, no pretending like it didn't happen. Same thing with, with Zechariah. He has nine months to contemplate what he believed about God, what God could do, and what actually God can do, and the difference there in what he should have said and what he actually said, what he does believe and what is actually true about God. The second thing that happens in exile, once you've realized what the mismatched pieces are, how the life has been put together poorly, is start to imagine what might be the new pieces of the puzzle. If you realize what the wrong pieces of the puzzle are, then you can start thinking, well, maybe what would be the right pieces? What would be the pieces that really fit? As the Jewish people come out of exile and they go back to the promised land, um, they build a temple again, but there's a difference. Remember what the old temple was coated in? Solid gold, right? What's the new temple coated in? Nothing. There ain't no solid gold coating this time. And I, that's a good thing. Because if you have something coated in solid gold, what might happen? You start worshiping the thing instead of the God for whom the thing has been built. And so they build the temple, but this time it's a little bit less distracting, a little bit less likely to lead people into heresy. And yes, they were ruled but this time, as they come back, but the rulers were not kings. Now they were the high priests. And yes, they lived by the word of God, but it's in the exile that they write down the, what we now call the Old Testament. And so now they have something they can pass around and they can all study together so everyone knows the word of God. And so on the other side of exile, after 70 years, thinking about what they did wrong and how might they do better, they come back and they live differently. And the same thing happens with Zechariah. On the other end of his silence... He has gone from this old man who shows up at the temple and asks, are you sure God can do that? I'm kind of old. To the dude who can sing that song, praising God out loud to the people. It's a, quite a bit of change. And he goes from name, naming uh, his son Zechariah, which you, you assume you name, you name a child um, after yourself, he names him John. Has it ever struck you all that John is kind of a short name for being biblical? Zedekiah? I mean, we have all these Hezekiah, these long names, and we get John. John actually is much longer originally. It's Yohanan. It, it, Yohanan, there's a guttural in there. I'm not going to get it right. But it, it's, there are actually three syllables there, and it means God is gracious. God is gracious to put up with a punk like Zechariah who doesn't believe. And now he has found this new piece of the puzzle, and a, pre, and a priest's son, you expect to be a priest like his father. And he, what, did, what did John go and do? Did he go and lead worship at the temple like his dad? No. He goes out to the desert. He is the unexpected wild child. He didn't get the child he expected. He got a different piece of the puzzle. Right. So in exile, there is this time to both recognize what went wrong, the wrong pieces put together, and there is a time to, to contemplate what might be the right God-given pieces to put our lives together. Now, I'm not going to tell you all to go into exile so you can spend time analyzing your life. I'm not going to tell you all to go take nine months and don't talk to anybody. Not going to happen either. But I am going to point out that we have entered the season of winter pretty definitively. We're in winter. And we have this inclination during winter to fill the darkness with food and to fill the silence with music. Right? And in the silence and the darkness, we want to fill them up with food and music. And I don't think it's by accident that we have distinctive food and music for the season. All the Christmas carols and my mama's cream to mint brownies. I mean, we have distinctive food for this time of year because we want to fill up this time. And yet I'm going to suggest that maybe before we get to the fullness of all the Christmas celebrations, that maybe it's good to have some time with winter and to be silent and to be still and to be in the dark, to be like Zechariah and be silent, to step away from what is comfort, to step away from what is comforting and familiar as Israel did, and maybe not to do it because we want to, but maybe to do it because we need to. A wise rabbi, Stephen Sager, once told me and some others that 
we tend to rush away from whatever makes us uncomfortable. We tend to rush away from silence, from darkness, from anything that has us less than happy and satisfied. And yet maybe we need to sit in those times. Maybe we need to sit in some dark, silent times, some stark times, some still times. For there are things we can only hear and only learn when there's nothing else to distract us. Maybe this is the season to sit in the darkness of the morning, to not turn on the news. I can tell you what the news will tell you. There's another problem somewhere in America. You can't do anything about it. That's what the news says, right? Just leave the news off. Turn the radio off. Don't rush off. Don't, just get up in the morning or, or late at night, whatever works for you. But just, just get up in the morning and don't turn on anything and just sit in the stillness and in the darkness and ponder. What are the pieces of my life? What are my friends, my families, my belief, my assumptions? And do they fit? Right? Do they fit? The, the challenge of asking that question is do they, uh, about do they fit is you can make any two puzzle pieces fit together if you try hard enough, right? You push them hard enough and what happens? Cardboard starts to bend and ah, they fit, right? We can get really comfortable with something that doesn't fit. I, I can have a natural cynical streak and I can get comfortable with that in a way that isn't healthy. And, and so I, I think the best way to tell whether something really does fit in our life, whether it, it's an attitude of a friend or a belief or an assumption or a habit we have, is to look at Jesus. I mean, that's always the answer, right? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and, and ask, does my, this friendship, does this friendship lead me to greater peace or does it drag me into anger and bitterness? Does this thing that I love, does it help me serve as Christ did or does it turn me inwards to be self-centered? Does this habit, does it lead me to be full of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, or does it distract me from what does? And if you're not sure, start reading a gospel. Always a good idea. Start reading some Gospels. Asking, do my habits and friendships, my way of speaking, my belief and assumptions, all the pieces of my life, do they reflect Jesus? Could I raise my hand and, at the joys and concerns and just say as a joy, and just go through and list all the parts of my life? Is there anything I would not want to raise my hand and share as a joy in church? Right? This way of thinking through things may take a while, but, well, it is Advent. And you know what the season of Advent is for? Waiting. All right. We haven't got to Jesus yet. Have a couple weeks. So this is a time to wait. It's my least favorite season of the year. I don't like this. I hate waiting. I hate stillness. I hate darkness. And I'm going to invite you to do the thing that I hate, and I'll do it right there with you. Wait in the darkness and the silence and see what it might teach you. And if you doze off, what it has taught you is you need to go to bed earlier. So go to bed earlier. Try it again. And I'm sure it has something else to teach you too. Amen.